You can be seated. You can be seated. Uh, it's such a great place to be. Um, if you've if you've not been with us the first couple weeks, the whole purpose of this uh, sermon series that we've started has been to uh, really make sure that we continue to uh, look at some things a little differently this Christmas season. Um, we've brought some different things into the church. We've uh, done a little more planning than we usually do. And the whole reason for that is because we want to encourage everyone not to just think about uh, the baby in the manger and the, the story of the nativity that we're so familiar with, but to dig a little deeper into those things as to why these things were so important, as Jerry really hit on last week, as to why Jesus Christ uh, had to come to earth. We know that from just kind of reviewing what Jerry preached on, there were so many prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to this coming Messiah that He had to come. He had to come uh, so that He could uh, be tested and, and He could feel our weaknesses and our infirmities so that He could fulfill that role uh, for us. He had to take on our sin so that He could provide a way uh, of reconciliation through the uh, imputing of His righteousness in our lives. And when we look at Christmas that way, it has a whole new uh, panoramic view of what God's plan of salvation was. Is there anything that gives you more peace or more comfort in this world than knowing that God, one, has a plan, That's right. and two, it's perfect, yeah. and three, that it will come to pass? Amen. There's a lot of peace in a world of, of chaos to know that those things are happening and they're sure. Um, the song that we sing, these songs that we sing at Christmas that Jerry was talking about, they can be very difficult to sing. But oh, what a meaning they have. The one line this morning, Oh, come, let us adore Him. Do we do that enough in our life? Do where we come to Him, not only needful, He knows what we need, but that we come to adore Him. Not the baby in the manger, not the teacher in the synagogue, but the one who hung on the cross, was buried and was resurrected so that you and I can have eternal life right now. We owe that adoration to Him. And especially during this season, we should be looking at Him and adoring Him and the plan that God has given us. I've been uh, given the task this morning to talk about uh, what we'll call the forgotten man of the Bible. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit to you uh, this morning about um, Joseph, um, who really doesn't say anything. He doesn't say anything in the Bible. He's very... The, the knowledge of who he is and who he was and what he's done and uh, why he was chosen to be the earthly father of, of Jesus Christ is very uh, speculative at some point. You know, he's, he's talked about in the book of Matthew. We're going to talk about that a little bit. He's talked about briefly in the book of Luke. And then anywhere else, he's basically uh, is just referred to when someone's mentioning Christ and they call him the son of Joseph. So there's really not a ton of information uh, that we have available here as to who Joseph was and, and why God might have chosen him to be the earthly father of the Messiah. But we do know a few things. And that's where we want to start this morning is what do we know about Joseph? We know that he never spoke in the Bible. I was talking to Dad on the phone the other night who I know is missing these things like crazy because he asked me about them. And he said, you know, it's funny when you think that Joseph never spoke in the Bible because he was, he was Jesus' earthly father. And like Jerry said, Jesus came to the earth to be uh, tempted and to feel the weaknesses that we have and the infirmities that we have. You know Joseph had to say something to Jesus. But it's not recorded. 
We know that if they had wrote down everything Jesus had done, there's not enough books that could, that could contain it. So we're left a little bit this morning to, to speculate or to ponder on who Joseph was and what he might have been and why. Um, it's a hard thing to do. We're not going to get outside the Scripture. We're not going to do that. It's not for us to do. But we want to let our, we want to let our minds kind of delve into who Joseph was other than the carpenter who was at the manger. Because there was more to it than that. There was more to it than that. Here's what we do know. We know his lineage. If you read the first chapter of Matthew, which you have to remember was written to the Jew, it was very important that the writer lay out the lineage of Joseph. Because as we're going to see, the, the main reason that, he, that, that God chose Joseph to be the earthly father of Jesus was that he had to come from a very specific royal lineage. So that's laid out in the first part of the first chapter of Matthew. It's interesting, and this is something that I was reading, is that as you read this lineage, first of all, the lineage and the legal line at that point in time was based strictly on the man. Okay? So that's where the lineage came from. However, in the lineage of Christ, you read, if you catch it, about some women. So I want to stop right there real quick and I want to say this. If you're here this morning and you feel like you're the least among us all and you feel like you're the most ordinary Joe that God can never use you or you've done things in your past that God can never save you from, His lineage is full of them. He takes ordinary people and He does extraordinary things. That's the God that we serve. So there's women in this lineage. And I want to name them, and I want you to think about who they were. Tamar, the first one that you recall in the Bible. Was she a real good lady? No. She dressed herself up as a prostitute after her husband died so that she could go be with Judah. Judah. She's in the lineage of Christ. Rahab. She didn't dress herself up like a prostitute. She was a prostitute. Not only that, but she was a Canaanite. She's in the lineage of Christ. A little different. Ruth. She demonstrated Christ's mercy and love and long-suffering and loyalty. In the book of Boaz, you can read all about that. Yeah, amen. And his providence and his sovereignty in our lives. What about Bathsheba? She committed adultery with King David. She comes back later, she's the mother of Solomon. It's in the line of Jesus. He can't use you? Sure he can. Sure he can. Here's the best part. It doesn't sound like a Christmas message, but when you accept Jesus Christ, who came for this purpose, you are adopted as an heir. And a co-heir. You become in the lineage of Jesus. That's why we're celebrating His birth this morning. That's why we celebrate this season that God sent a Savior. And we so desperately needed it. Joseph was a carpenter. By trade, he was a simple man, and he was practical. Now, we know that. You guys know carpenters. I live beside Sam Pridemore, one of the best carpenters that's ever been around here. Sam's a simple fella, plain spoken, good with his hands, very practical. That tells us a little bit about Joseph. He probably was very simple in his, needful, in his needs in life. He was practical with his hands. He enjoyed his work. He just had a plan to provide for his family. You've got to remember, these people were very young. At that point, when these people were betrothed to one another, 
These marriages were established. They probably grew up together, him and Mary. And he had a plan. He had a plan that he would learn this skill that his dad probably did. That he would be a carpenter. And through that he would provide for his wife. And they would have children. And he would pass that on to them. There's, there's, uh, there's honor in that. He didn't come to the rich. He didn't come for the wealthy. Our Jesus was born on the bottom shelf so that everybody could reach Him. Not just so those with, with uh, money or power could get to Him. He chose one of the most simple professions at the time, other than a shepherd, <laughs> to come to and make the earth, earthly father of our Messiah. We know that because after Jesus' birth and they gave the sacrifice of two turtle doves. They didn't have the money to get that good sacrifice. They were poor. They were very poor. But there was an importance that Joseph had to live a God-centered life and to take care of a family. So that tells us a little bit about what we do know about him. A little bit. The next part of what we want to talk about is this occurrence and this amazing experience that happened. We have two different stories about the nativity. I mean, we read these stories and we think that, oh wow, this angel came to Mary and told her she was going to have the Messiah. And at the same time, this angel came to Joseph and said, oh yeah, she's going to have the Messiah. And Joseph was excited about it. Mary, That's not how it happened. That's not how it happened. We have a church full of young men in here. And a church full of young women. And a church full of married people. I want you to think for a minute that you're engaged to this young lady going to be married at a time when the wedding is the emphasis of the wedding is not the woman at this time. The emphasis of the Jewish wedding was the bridegroom, was the man. So this young man who's so excited about his future, he's excited about his wedding, he's engaged to this um, beautiful uh, young lady, And she disappears. She leaves town in this waiting period. If you want to know where she was at, she was over there with Elizabeth. She had received, and we're going to learn more about Mary next week, but she was over there with Elizabeth, who was also pregnant at the time with John the Baptist. They were celebrating the fact that Mary had received this an eye-opening word from God that she was going to conceive and that John the Baptist was leaping in the womb and everything was exciting. That's where Mary was. Joseph finds out that Mary uh, is with child. We're going to start reading here real quick. Matthew 1 and verse 18. And now the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Alright, so as Mary was off and she decides to come back into town, alright, she decides to come back, now all of a sudden she is found uh, with child uh, from the Holy Ghost. Okay? Then Joseph her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. So let's talk for just a second. Joseph finds out that this young lady that he's uh, betrothed to uh, is pregnant. Young man, you hadn't been with her yet. And you find out she's pregnant. It it would take an angel from God to convince me that I didn't already know what was going on. We live in a society today that's much different than it was then, obviously. But you can't even run into someone out in town and smile and have a conversation, young people, without the other young person getting upset about it. Your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Imagine this story. I'm so excited for my wedding. It's going to be all about me. I'm taking this young bride. We're going to have a family. Oh, wait a minute. She's pregnant. 
And I'm certain it's not mine. I can only imagine. So can you imagine for just a second as we think about Joseph's discovery of this, the ridicule, the devastation that he must have felt? Just overwhelming devastation of everything that I wanted, everything that I hoped for, everything that was coming my way is over. The friends in his small circle, you know he probably tried to hide this at first. We, we try to hide everything. But the friends in his small circle probably were made aware. He probably, and this is speculation, but he probably got a small circle of his best friends and said, dude, listen, you ain't going to believe what I just found out. And I have no idea how I'm going to handle this. She's pregnant. It ain't mine. I'm devastated. I don't know what to do. And you can imagine being a godly, just man that he was. He knew the law. Don't forget Jesus Christ was born under the law. He knew the law. He was in the synagogue. He knew that over in Deuteronomy, what it said that they were to do with people who were in this situation. It says that you bring them outside to the gate, the man and the woman, and you stone them to death so that you can rid yourself of the evil. That's what it says. He knew that. But he wanted to show mercy and grace. And he just didn't know what to do. He loved this woman. So he's in a big dilemma. What do I do? Do I protect her? Do I put her to shame if I go and I tell what's happened? I'm in a mess. They'll kill us, kill her. They'll kill her. They'll stone her to death. It's a perfect look and a glimpse and a shadow of what God has done for us through the old covenant passing away and the new covenant coming about. Joseph knew the law. Joseph basically de- decided against the law and he chose grace, which is what we're asked to do today. He shows grace and mercy in the case with Mary. So I'm going to read just a little bit more. In verse 20 it says, But while he thought on these things, you guys ever laid in bed at night and all these things that you're dealing with, all these dilemmas that you have, that's when you ponder on them? That's when you, what's the term, Papa and Dad, cipher on them? You cipher on things a little bit? All these things that's bothering you? When the lights are off and you, sometimes your eyes are open, eyes closed. Can you imagine Joseph being the man that he was? Probably a very simple house, laying there on that old firm bed and thinking, what in the world am I going to do? <coughs> Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him into a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord, brother. So right there we have the dream begins and we have an explanation. Joseph, let me explain this to you. Let me explain this to you. Son of David. Son of David. So Joseph laying there pondering this in this vision, he begins, I'm sure, to think, I'm a legal line of David. Now put a pause on this. it's, It's so deep and it's so good. Do you realize that at this point in time when when Messiah came that every woman every Israel in all of Israel in Jerusalem every woman wanted to have the Messiah Can you imagine that being a young lady and thinking we're waiting on a Messiah I could be the one I could be the one Do you know that every young man in the line of David thought I could be the one There's prophecy that says that I that the Messiah has to come from the line of David. And it was to the virgin, not a virgin. So there was one. You imagine all these young people thinking, I could really be the the line of the Messiah. 
So he's laying there pondering this and he thinks back to the uh, prophecy in Isaiah about the line of David. And all of a sudden, I can imagine his mind just starts to shift. It starts to go, wait a minute. Hold on, is this really happening? Is this really an angel? What's going on? How about Bethlehem? Wasn't there a prophecy about Bethlehem? And then all of a sudden we get this decree that all the world should be taxed and registered and they had to return back to their land. In Micah, we know that prophecy's there. So you know that all that's going through Joseph's head. And he's just like, oh my goodness, what's going on? So he got an explanation, right? Well, then he gets instruction. Then he gets instruction. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou, thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Joseph, relax. The baby that she's carrying is conceived by the Holy Spirit. You're fulfilling prophecy from everlasting. And by the way, let me tell you what to do. Once you're married and she has this baby, you're going to name him Jesus. Why? Because that was prophesied too. That He would come to save us from our sins. So He begins to get this instruction. And there's a lot in that name. Oh, is there not power in that name? What name can you say in this entire world that has more power, more staying power, the only saving power than to say Jesus Christ? They've tried to throw it out. They've tried to disprove it for over 2,000 years. And it's still saving people. There's never been any name that's had more of an impact on this awful world than the name of Jesus Christ. And if you're going to heaven, it's the only way you're going. You're not working your way there. You're not bringing gifts and getting there. You're not making offerings and tithes and getting there. You're not going down to the river and being baptized to get there. You are going through and by faith and grace from God through the blood of Jesus Christ. He was born to die. And He was given the name Jehovah Saves. It's pretty simple. I can't even imagine Joseph then. I know what it was like for me when I found out that Angel was going to have our first child. I was uh, overrun. I didn't know what was going on. My head was going 10,000 directions. It didn't get any better when she was born. I didn't know what I was doing. The only thing I knew is that my mom and dad were getting smarter for some reason. <laughs> Can you imagine if they said, oh, oh boy, by the way, it's the Messiah. <laughs> Jesus saves and guess what? You're going to be responsible for Him. So not only can I imagine that Joseph was pretty excited, I can imagine he was pretty nervous. Amen. What am I going to do with this? Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. So I'm going to throw something at you here that came to me as I was going through the lineage of Christ. And we've already, somebody mentioned numbers in the, in, the, in the Bible. And there's all kinds of studies to numbers in the Bible. But there's a number that's associated with Joseph that I want to give you. That, that I, I, I just, was, I was reading through, it just jumped out at me. It says God with us. How many generations in the genealogy is listed from Abraham to Jesus? 14, 14, 14. That's six groups of seven. Seven being the number of completeness, right? Perfection. Six being the number of man. In due time, at an appointed time, in the perfect time, God sent His Son to become man in this generation that Joseph was in. Now, 
God has a perfect plan. And that's part of it. In the, in the fullness and the appointed time, He sent God with us. That's not coincidence. That's not coincidence. As Second Peter said, is that we have eyewitness. We were eyewitness to His majesty. But you have a more sure word of prophecy. He said, we walked with Him. We talked with Him. We seen the things He done. But now you have prophecy. Proven, factual, biblical prophecy from everlasting to everlasting. It will happen. We celebrate Christmas because Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, was born on the bottom shelf in some animal trough laid in a manger so that the lowest of the lows could have access to Him so that you and I can go to heaven. That's Christmas. That's Christmas. It's not just a bunch of shepherds and wise men show up there and all of a sudden they sing a few songs and they leave a few gifts and they go off on their way. And Joseph and Mary smiling, holding this baby. Now what are we supposed to do? That's not how it works. There was a plan put into place. And they fulfilled this plan. A few other things here. Now Joseph, he's been exp- the issue and the situation has been explained to Joseph. He's been given instruction. Just like happens every Sunday. When you come in here and you're lost, now listen, it's Christmas, but they're still lost people, right? And Jesus was sent here to save them. So we're going to tell you about Him. When you sit in this church or any other church and you're lost, you're going to be faced with a dilemma. We're going to shoot this word at you, and it's going to hit you. And what you do with it's yours. Just like Joseph, he had a dilemma. Now I'm trying here. I'm no angel from the Lord, trust me. But I'm trying here to to show you an explanation of why you feel like you do. You are no good. Guess who else ain't no good? This guy. We all need a Savior. Jesus Christ came to be that Savior. And He's offering it to you as a free gift. You don't have to work your way there. How much work would it take? He's just offering it to you. It's a perfect time for a gift. Thank God for that indescribable gift. Right? Well, there's instruction. Just like the angel came and said, Hey, name him Jesus. I'm going to tell you this morning, you need to be saved. Well, how do I do that? First off, you've got to know you're a sinner. You gotta know you ain't no good. If you think you're good, forget it. You gotta to come to him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, saying, I know I'm no good. And you put all that on your back, and the blood ran down the foot of the cross, and it was because of me. You gotta know that first. Then when he knocks on the door, when you feel that at your heart, you gotta open it up. And you ain't going to get by doing it in secret. You ain't going to get by saying some prayer in the back half-heartedly thinking maybe if I say this my problems will go away. That's not how it works. You've got to come with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And when He knocks on your heart, you've got to make a move. You've got to make a move. You've got to confess Him with your mouth. You got to know you're a sinner. You got to believe in your heart. You got to confess him with your mouth. And thou shalt be saved. And if he saves you, he'll keep you. That's the dilemma you've got this morning if you're lost. If you've already been there, done that, got the the souvenir, the Holy Spirit, (laughs) then you should be able to come and adore him this morning. And thank him for that wonderful gift that was given to us so many years ago Amen, in a barn Amen. in a manger Thank you, Lord. to the lowest of lows yeah. God. then here's his decision then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife 
And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and she called his name Jesus. I hear you, Lord. I hear you. I know you're talking to me. I'm going to make one move. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do what you're asking me to do. Listen, he also knew her not. He also knew her not until Jesus was born. Why was that important? To remove any doubt that he was the earthly child of Joseph. That his fatherly genetic code was sinless. And that he was righteous. And it wasn't tainted with the blood from the first Adam. But also, back to why Joseph. Why was it so important that he didn't know her? Because when you choose to follow Jesus Christ, there is a level of self-denial. There is a level of sacrifice. I'm just going to be real with you. Joseph, a young man, Mary a virgin, engaged for so long, couldn't wait till the wedding party and the feast. And what a beautiful thing the Jewish wedding is. Couldn't wait to consummate that marriage, I'm sure. And he went however many months from the time he found out till she was born without knowing her. That's self-denial. It's sacrifice. Because he knew what was at stake. And he was obedient to that. Now what kind of reward did he get for that? Is that we don't know. As far as we know, he was probably dead before the adult ministry of Christ. Definitely before the crucifixion. We assume. Because he said, this is your mother. Right? I mean, he never met, Joseph's never mentioned again. He may have never seen Jesus' earthly adult ministry. We don't know. But he was given the responsibility of caring for and guiding God's only son. Now, we think it's tough. I've got a son. I love my son. He's not God's son, obviously, right? But I love him. He's talented. He's got a lot of opportunities at him. That's a burden to raise a son. Men in here, it's a burden to raise a son. To try to teach him the right way. To try to show him that no matter how old they are, they can't whip you. To try to show them how to love their future wife. How to raise future children. And we fail at it so often. And I'm sure Joseph did things in those years that he was raising Jesus that he probably laid down at night and thought, man, I have royally messed this up. And I've got the Son of God. (laughs) What kind of punishment am I looking at for this one? That's not how God works. When you have the Son of God in your life, now Joseph was physically raising him. We have him dwelling on the inside. But when you have the Son of God in your life, you don't have to worry about punishment. All that's already been paid for. Sure, you're going to lay your head down at night and say, I have royally messed this up. But guess what? He'll sing send those songs to you at night. I'm sure he did Joseph too. As Jesus got a little older, you remember him being in the temple? They traveled a few days, didn't even know where he was at. They went back to him. You imagine how scared he was, Joseph? You imagine how scared they were? Like we lose our kid in the mall for five minutes, it's panic. Yeah, you know, they, they traveled for two or three days and they didn't even know where he was at. Can you imagine the panic? Can you imagine what Joseph, just take your, can you imagine what Joseph, take your mind there for just a second. What would he have even said? It's Jesus, right? He knew who Jesus was. But Joseph was a man of God. And I think that that's another reason why God chose him and selected him and knew him in his mother's womb and knew that his plan would be filled at this appointed time because he was that type of man. 
And I want to close with this. There's something that we need to, to say. Joseph did what we all have to do if we're going to be Christians, if we're going to accept Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about what church you go to and what name's over the door. If you're going to have Jesus Christ in your life, as Lord of your life, we all want a Savior. But will you make Him Lord of your life? And that's what keeps you in your seat. You know you're no good. You know you've sinned and fall short. You know that. What keeps you in your seat is you don't want a Lord over your life. But if that's what you want this morning, then you're going to have to say something. And this is what Joseph basically said. Anywhere, anything, anytime, at any cost. That's what we have to say. I'm willing to claim Jesus anywhere, anytime, and at any cost. It wasn't just as simple as Jesus Christ being born in a manger. There were people looking to kill Him. They were fulfilling prophecy that they would kill all these young children. And Joseph said, He's mine anywhere, anytime, any place, at any cost. And He took Him into Egypt. Just why, why Egypt? Prophecy. He said He'll call Him out of Egypt. Anywhere, anytime. At any cost. Now I'm going to tell you something that the book of Hebrews chapter 10 quotes back to the book of Psalms. And this is what we have to be willing to do. Joseph did it. As we'll hear more about Mary, she did the same thing. But in the 10th chapter of Hebrews, it says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. You've heard that lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Can you imagine Jesus Christ sitting in heaven about that appointed time from the beginning and looking over at His Father and saying, Lo, I come to do Your will. You've written this whole book about me. The whole plan's about this plan of salvation. It's time to go. And then he ends up in a manger in the lowest of the lows when he's given an explanation to Joseph. Listen, it's not always going to be a slam dunk case for us. Sometimes we have to make decisions in the middle of mass confusion. Sometimes we don't understand. That's how it works. Joseph did the same thing. But when it comes to that, you have to trust in whom you believe that He is able to keep you and that He is able to perform and finish that work that He started in you and that He'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's what we have to do. What did Mary say? According to your word, let it be done. Right? Listen, that's where we're at this morning. Why Joseph? Because God said so. I can give you all this stuff and he may just look down and laugh. But it was Joseph because God said so. And it was appointed that way from the beginning. And God's promises are just as sure today as they were when the Holy Spirit conceived the baby in Mary, when Joseph named him Jesus, when he raised him in a simple life to work with his hands and to feel what we felt and raised him up, taking him to the synagogue to learn the law that He was born under, that He was sent to fulfill, and that He took to the cross with Him and nailed to it when He died so that He could take our sins to the grave and become the first fruits of all those that would call on His name. That's what it's about this morning. If you're lost here this morning, you've got a golden ticket. You'll never have another Christmas like you can have this year. By accepting the indescribable gift that the Creator of the universe sent to you free. Free for you. But what a price He paid. But it's free this morning. As I ask you to stand to your feet, we'll call Brother Jerry.
We should be excited about Christmas. We really should be excited about Christmas. Most importantly, if you're saved, you should be excited that you have Jesus Christ on the inside. And you've been entrusted with that. And if you're lost, you need to choose Him today. Thinking about not hearing much of Joseph, his conversation, the things he did, you can rest assured there is a record book. 